one to have worked for many years, accumulated an income producing real estate portfolio, finally retired when shortly after a litigator comes in and takes away all of your assets, leaving you with nothing in your nest egg. Randy Hughes, also known as Mr. Land Trust, has been a real estate investor since 1969 and uses land trusts as a privacy and asset protection strategy. He also teaches others how to set up their own land trusts. In this episode, Randy shares with us the benefits of using a land trust, along with sharing some incredible personal stories of how land trusts protected him and his assets from frivolous lawsuits. Today we have a very special guest, Mr. Land Trust, Randy Hughes. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Dion. I'm glad to be with you and excited about today's topic. I am too, and this is actually not something that I've ever researched or looked into, nor have I really heard many other investors speaking about this particular topic. So before we get into the meat and potatoes, why don't we just go ahead and tell our listeners a little bit about your background uh, and what it is that you are doing right now. Okay. Well, I am a full-time real estate investor, and I have been since I started buying single-family houses in 1969. That's when I bought my first house. Um, so this is my 50th year in the business, which and any real estate that they own in their name now to get it out of their name as quick as they can. Uh, now, I've been using these trusts in my own business for 40-some years, um, so I've got a pretty good uh, understanding of them, obviously. Uh, and, and so it's kind of an avocation of mine. I travel all over the country speaking mo mostly to real estate investment association clubs. Uh, you know, they have a monthly meeting and, and oftentimes have a speaker come in and, uh, and I, I serve as, uh, as a monthly, uh, meeting speaker, uh, from coast to coast and uh, have been doing that for, for 20 years now, uh, because I, I really feel like it's it, you know it's time for me to give back uh, to my industry to the knowledge that I've gained over these years and and help people realize that it's just too risky to own real estate in their name personally and oftentimes people don't believe me and uh, carry on uh, buying and buying and buying in their own name uh, until they get hit with something there's a lot of weird stuff that goes on in this business uh, and and if you don't learn to protect those assets as you uh, spend time and money accumulating them, uh, you may end up uh, 20 years down the road with uh, someone taking all those assets away from you for, for some frivolous lawsuit. And I don't, I don't teach people beyond these concepts to uh, have them take advantage of other people. I say, you know, if you sign a note, you should pay it. Uh, if, you, if you borrow money on a, on a mortgage and a note, then you should pay it. And I've never uh, defaulted on a loan. I've never paid a loan payment late in 50 years. But if, if you're coming after me and my assets because of some frivolous lawsuit, something I'm not responsible for, then I feel that, that I deserve to give you a battle uh, and make it as, as hard on you as possible to get to my family's assets. So that's kind of the basis of, of my thinking. Now, when you said uh, just earlier, you mentioned that these trusts, they add a, another, an additional layer of protection. I think a lot of people out there typically think of, well, when I buy a property, uh, whether it be single family, multifamily, it goes into an LLC. So isn't an LLC enough of protection? Uh, no, it really isn't. And, and here's the reason why, Dion. Uh, when you form an LLC, if, uh, if you form it in the wrong state, uh, you could have no asset protection. I'll give you an example. If you've got a single member LLC and you formed it in any state other than Delaware, Nevada, or Wyoming, you don't have any asset protection because you don't have charging order protection in a single member LLC in those states. The three states that I just gave do give charging order protection to the members of a single member LLC. So uh, a lot of people that have these LLCs are, are uh, uh, under the mistaken impression that they have asset protection and, and they don't realize that they don't until it's too late. Now, in my opinion, Dion, the, 
the first step for a real estate investor in asset protection is privacy of ownership. Because the general public thinks that anybody who invests in real estate is rich. I mean, you could be uh, upside down on your loan to value ratio. You could have tremendous negative cash flow. You could be near bankruptcy. But if your neighbors know that you own that 50 unit apartment building down the street, they consider you rich. And just by that mere public impression, you're a greater target for a lawsuit. Now, back to your question about LLCs. I can look up who owns an LLC in every state except Wyoming and uh, uh, New Mexico, I believe. So what that means is you don't have any privacy of ownership when you, when you deed directly into your LLC. Now, with trust, there's no registry for trust. You can't look up who owns a trust. So you have immediate and definite um, privacy of ownership when you hold title in the trust. Uh, I, I can't tell you, I get so many calls every week because if, if you type into Google land trust, uh, you, you get me and my website and I have my phone number on my website. So I get these calls every week from people just had one yesterday, as a matter of fact, from uh, Massachusetts and they call up and said, uh, I want to know who owns the, the, the land, such and such land trust. Uh, and I said, well, why do you want to know? Well, it's across the street from me and their tenants are raising hell and I don't like their tenants. And, <laughs> and I, I just say, hey, wait, wait, wait a minute. You know, it's not me, you know. Well, how do I find the owner? I say, you don't. That's the reason why they put it in a trust is they don't want the public to know who owns it. So these, they really, these uh, trusts really do work from a privacy standpoint. Now, I know most attorneys will tell you, oh, don't use a land trust. They have no asset protection. Basically, that's true. They're not designed as asset protection tech, uh, tools. They're designed for privacy tools. But like I said, the first step in asset protection is to be private about what you own. Because if, if you run over somebody's dog and they go to their lawyer and say, I'm, I'm going to sue this guy, the first thing the lawyer is going to do is turn to his computer and type in your name. And if, if you, his printer starts printing page after page of real estate uh, addresses that are in your name, his, the attorney's going to turn to his client and say, hey, I think we got a pretty good case here, just on that basis. Now, let's turn the tables a little bit, Neon, and say, you run over somebody's dog, you go to your lawyer, and, he, and, you say, and the guy says, I want to sue Dion. He killed my dog. Sue him for a million dollars. And they type in Dion's name, and the printer doesn't budge. Nothing. Now the lawyer turns to his client and says, well, Bob, or Dion in this case, I'm not so sure we got a good case here, but I tell you what, I'll sue Dion. I'll sue him until the cows come home. I just need you to get your checkbook out, write me a check to my escrow account for $10,000. That's all to get started, just only $10,000. And I'll start chasing Dion. And every, every month I'm going to send you a letter telling you how many hours I spent chasing Dion. And when I run out of the 10,000, I'll ask for another 10,000. Now, what do you think the odds are he's gonna to wanna to sue you? If he's gotta write a check for 10 grand versus zero on a contingency fee basis, chances are he's not gonna sue you under those circumstances. So the privacy of ownership is so important, let alone all the other benefits of using a trust, like um, you know, avoiding probate. <clears throat> it's a big, big deal. In fact, um, uh, at the end of this conversation, uh, I'll, I'll give out some information where people can get a, a booklet I've written uh, with over 50 reasons to use a trust. That's free. They can just go to my website and pick it up. So I um, hope it didn't beat that horse too too much to death. But <laughs> No, not at <laughs> all. I, I think oh. – um, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. <clears throat> well, yeah, one other point I wanted to make on your LLC question because it always comes up. If Let's say you buy 10 apartment buildings and you follow your lawyer's advice, and you put all 10, title all 10 of them in an LLC. You've just created a nexus for a lawsuit. Let's say you have a lawsuit on one building, the, you're sued and you lose, the, the plaintiff gets a judgment against the owner of that building. Who's the owner? The LLC. Now they've got a judgment against everything in that LLC, all 10 buildings. Now, it, obviously, you know, grandma and grandpa taught us all that you don't put all your eggs in one basket well you don't put all your real estate in one anything not one trust not one llc not one corporation 
or you're inviting uh, a lawsuit on everything you own, and that's pretty stupid. So with these um, trusts, right, my understanding based off of what you just explained, you said it doesn't it doesn't provide protection, but it provides privacy is the key thing, right? Yeah, and privacy provides a certain level of protection. Protection, okay. So when you're buying these properties, you're basically putting it into this trust and then you use the LLC as a beneficiary is what correct. you said. And That's that, correct. And how does that work? when it comes to estate planning, like are there benefits to that? Well, there are. Um, and if you, uh, if you make the beneficiary of your trust an LLC, and then let's say you, you're a hundred percent member of that LLC, just for example, uh, then you could make the successor member of your LLC, the, uh, your living trust. And I, th I think everybody should have a living trust as well. Uh, living trusts, in my opinion, are, are pretty much worthless when you're alive. They have no asset protection and no privacy, but they're terrific when you die. They become immediately irrevocable upon your death. So it, you can structure this like a, <clears throat> like a V to where you got all your real estate up here, it goes down to your LLC, which flows down to your living trust. So the moment you die, everything drops into that living trust and is controlled by the terms that you, you dictated when you formed that trust. You see, that's another reason why people shouldn't own real estate in their name because, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> if you own real estate in your name today, Dion, and you die to my, tonight, your heirs aren't going to be able to have control of that real estate for at least six months in some communities, a year or two years, because your estate has to go through a process called probate. And that's a legal process that not only takes time and money, but it also drags everything through the county courthouse. In other words, everything that Dion owns is going to be published uh, in, in the courthouse records. And everybody who now owns it, meaning all your heirs, uh, will also be noted. So it's a very public process. Uh, and that's why smart people and many wealthy people, you never hear about what assets they have after they die because it all went under, under uh, water to their heirs because they don't want the public to know everything. And I think that's a smart way of doing it. It's nobody's business what you own. It's not your business what I own or control. It's not your business what, what anybody else owns or controls. Uh, and, and people have got to get this through their thick heads that the privacy is becoming more and more important, especially now with this virus. I mean, uh, the lawyers are going to think of all new and creative ways to sue us over this virus issue, uh, especially property owners. So if you didn't believe in trust before the virus, I sure hope you believe in them now. You just mentioned with the living <laughs> trust. You said that it's irrevocable. So meaning that whatever you stipulated will basically survive for, you know, just on an ongoing basis, correct? Right. So would, let's say the assets in that living trust, could they be sold or, I mean, they really couldn't, your heirs couldn't do anything with it. If you said that they cannot be sold and they can't do anything at all, right? Well, if that's if those are the terms you put in the trust agreement, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, but you can put anything you want in the trust agreement as long as it's you know not illegal. So, um, let me give you an example. Um, when my wife and I put together our living trust uh, many years ago, uh, our my two daughters were very young children, and we wanted to. Uh, not only take care of them, but to kind of incentivize them. Uh, and, and so we put terms in our living trust, for example, that if, if, the, uh, if, if the daughter wanted to get married and needed money to get married, they could come to the trust. If they wanted to start a business, they could present a business plan to the trustee of the trust. 
and he or she could decide whether or not they're going to take give any money to them to start that business um it's it's a way of controlling beyond the grave but they're your assets so i think you've got every right to do that if, that, if that's what you want to do uh we put um another clause in the trust said um if 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 they wanted to buy a house <clears throat> they could come to the trust for the 20 percent down payment now what that implies is if you think it through they're going to have to get the 80 percent somewhere else right and if they go to the bank to borrow 80 percent then they got their 20 percent down payment but what's the bank going to require dion to get an 80 percent loan on a property there probably i'll go ahead probably a job right yeah so what we were trying to do was create responsible adults uh, that, that, that had a job and worked. <clears throat> See, the worst thing you can do is give a kid a bunch of money for, for, with no strings attached because you're going to create alcoholics and drug addicts and, and God knows what, uh, lazy bums that just want to sit around and you know, party or whatever it is and live off the trust. You're not doing your kids any favor, uh, handing them just you know, carte blanche all the money they need. So the living trust is a great tool. Now, what's interesting about the difference between a title holding trust and a living trust is that the title holding trust that we're talking about holding the title to this real estate is what I call beneficiary driven. That means the beneficiary makes all the decisions on what happens inside that trust. The trustee merely holds title she just holds that title and does nothing else until it's time to sell the property, okay? A living trust is just the opposite. It's trustee-driven. The trustee makes all the decisions on what happens inside that trust, and the beneficiaries just go along for the ride. So five and a half years ago, my wife died. I was the trustee and am the trustee of her living trust. My daughters are the beneficiaries. I make all the decisions on what happens inside that trust. The daughters don't make any decisions. Mm -hmm. You see the difference between the living trust and the title holding trust? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I w another thing that just came to mind was typically in real estate syndications, you have the LLC, which is like basically the managing entity that buys the property essentially. But with that LLC, you might have other LLCs that own the, uh, the, the, the property at the property level LLC, okay? the entity, the managing entity LLC. So a thought that came to mind is how could we use these trusts to, let's say, protect the different partners, their interests in the event that you do have someone being sued, like an LP or maybe a GP on one of these deals that are all involved in this? Well, you know, first off, just by holding the title in an entity where you can't find out who the owner is without litigation uh, will will stop a whole lot of frivolous lawsuits. Um, so would you, as I I'm sorry, would you have to actually put the, 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 the title of that like, let's, let's say we're talking about like a hundred unit apartment community. You have to put that community in the name of the trust or could you do it? Let's say if we have Joe here, his, he would actually have a trust that owns this LLC that owns this property. Well, you, you could do it that way too. Uh, and, and if I were investing with others, I, I will never be a partner with anybody. And the reason why is because I've been a partner with people and it's disastrous. It never, ever, ever works out. So, but that doesn't mean you can't invest with other people. It's just, you, you need to do it the right way. So let's say you put the title to the property, the hundred unit building in a trust. Nobody can look up who owns it. So all that hundred tenants in there, when they all get mad and they want to find out who the owner is and go, go over to his house and, and throw pumpkins at him. They're not going to be able to do that because they don't know who owns that property. You, you see, see that simple benefit right there? Just the fact that the tenants can't look up who owns it and, and cause havoc in your life is a big, big savings. So trusts are wonderful tools for 
um, not only owners, but property managers. But so if you put the title in a trust, then you could make the beneficiary of the trust uh, an LLC. And then if we had, uh, let's say we had 25 investors, 25 owners, they could all be members. 20, you could have 25 members in the LLC. Or what I would do is I would form either my own LLC or a personal property trust to hold my interest in the LLC. That way I'm not doing business with all those so-called partners at the uh, beneficiary at the uh, membership level. My entity is doing business with them. And there's a big difference between my name personally doing business with you and my ent entity that only has this asset in it. So if, if everything goes to hell in a handbasket, and I lose that interest, so be it. At least I didn't sign my name personally and everything that I have control of in that, just over that one investment. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. It almost seems as though that that would really be beneficial, especially from the limited partner perspective. Because limited partners, I mean, they're, they're just silent investors, essentially passive investors, right? So they're not making the decisions you have the GPs that are actually making the decisions. And if they did do something wrong, granted, you do have the, the LLC structure. It's allegedly, you know, supposedly the GPs are the ones that have unlimited liability and limited partners supposed to have limited liability. But it almost seems as though this could add an extra layer of protection for the LPs. Yeah. Yes, I, I believe it would. And, and especially for people that aren't in uh, limited partnerships, you know, there are a whole lot of mom and pops out there that just buy real estate on their own uh, or maybe with one or two other people. And it's not as sophisticated as, as a, as a uh, limited partnership and all that structure. So it works well on, on really every, every level. Uh, these title holding trusts can hold title to any real estate asset, whether it's an apartment building, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, a single family rental house, um, air rights, mineral rights. I had a guy call me oh, a year or two ago and he said, hey, Randy, I want to buy your home study course and learn how to create land trusts. I said, okay, that's great. What are you going to do with them? He said, well, I'm down here in Kentucky and I own 1,500 oil and gas leases. And some of them go boom and some of them go bust. And so I don't want to put them all in one entity. So he bought my home study course and learned how to create his own trust, and he created 1,500 trusts wow. and put each lease in, uh, in separate trusts. Uh, it was very smart, uh, not only to do that, but to get my home study course, because my home study course cost like 597 bucks, <laughs> and he did it all. Uh, you know, he couldn't afford it to hire an attorney. It, it would have been prohibitively expensive for him to hire an attorney to create 1,500 trusts, but for Roughly 600 bucks, he, he created 1,500 trusts with my uh, training and my form. So, um, uh, just it's just you know I I have so many so many stories I can tell you, Dion, of where um, where my students have been uh, saved from uh, uh, crazy tenants, um, uh, and, and things that have happened to me. I, 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 do we have time for me to tell another story? Yeah, sure, please. So in, uh, in 1985, I acquired a shopping center with a friend of mine. And I insisted on putting the title in a trust. He's, he didn't know any better. He said, okay, fine with me. In the year 2000, my friend moved out of Illinois, where I live, and to Florida. And became a very successful real estate developer. Made millions of dollars. Until when? You got a guess as to when that stopped? What, 2008, right before then? Good guess. Good <laughs> guess. You got it. Yeah. And in 2008, the world came down on him and he started losing millions of dollars. Last time I talked to him, he had $23 million of liens and judgments against him. Now, I was only concerned about one lien, and that was a bank in Florida came all the way back to Illinois and filed a lien in my county against him. Now, he hadn't lived in my county for 15 years, but the bank came back thinking, well, maybe he owns something up there and we'll grab that. 
$3.2 million lien. Now, if he and I had gone on the title to that shopping center, personally, I would have just lost everything. Everything, Dion, because yeah. you know, 35 years later, that $3.2 million lien, it didn't matter uh, if I own 1% or, uh, or 99%. A lien is a lien is a lien. So when you go on title with somebody, you are, it's, it's almost worse than being married from a legal standpoint because everything they do affects you. So I could have gone home that night if I hadn't been uh, smart enough to put the, my property in the trust. I would have gone home that night and said, honey, we lost everything today. Can you imagine working three and a half decades on a property and losing it because of something somebody else did? And just because we had the title in a trust, that lien didn't attach to the property, and I was saved. Now, if that doesn't convince you to use a trust, I apologize. I can't do a better job than telling you that story. Can we look at the actual costs and everything? Because you did mention the course. So what are the typical costs and kind of how long is the process? You know, how realistic is it for people to be able to handle this process themselves? Well, it's very realistic because, uh, you know, I've spent 20 years refining my course. Uh, I've personally written it uh, in a way that it's just one real estate investor talking to another one. It's not a bunch of uh, legal talk. Um, uh, I've improved the forms uh, many times over. In fact, just this last summer, I, I uh, issued my 6.0 trust agreement that my students are now using. And, uh, and like I said, a, a hard copy of my basic course is $597. That's all. Uh, download is $497. And you get audio of me, uh, audio and video of me teaching the material to a live audience, going through the forms, going through the course guide. Uh, you know, so it, it's going to take you a good Saturday afternoon to uh, to learn this and, uh, and formulate your first trust. But once you get that first trust template created, it's on your computer, and then it takes you five minutes to create a trust. And the cost of a trust is zero. It doesn't cost you anything to form a trust like it does a corporation or an LLC. So that's why you could you can be a very active real estate investor and own 20, 50, 100 properties and put them in 20, 50, 100 separate trusts at no cost to you. So uh, you, you can't say, well, Randy, that's a great idea, but it's too expensive because it doesn't cost anything. <laughs> it, it takes your time. But you know, the way I look at it, Dion, is you know, what's your net worth worth? Is it worth a little extra time and, and 600 bucks to protect it? I think, I think most people would come to the conclusion that, yeah, it's probably worth it. What piece of advice would you give to new people, new investors, just getting into the business? Uh, I started in the single family house business. And then I tried to uh, get into multifamily apartment buildings. And I did that on our campus, University of Illinois campus. Uh, and I soon found out that I'm not, it's, uh, uh, I'm not an apartment guy. And I know other people that are not single family house guys either. They're apartment guys. But I say to new investors, find what, what, uh, what fits your personality. Single family houses and my personality go together. Uh, I didn't like the apartments because, especially on, in student housing, because I had 100% turnover every year. I, I don't like 100% turnover every year. I have about... 18 to 20 percent turnover in my houses that allows me to do other things in life besides be a slave to my properties um, so that just is how I look at it you know but I know a lot of people that made a ton of money in the apartment business so uh, that's that's great for them but you know experiment around get a feel for you know what do you like do you like uh, uh, Walgreens uh, where there's a triple net lease and, and not much to do but collect your check uh, do you like houses, apartment buildings? Uh, just you know, experiment around, get a feel for, for what might fit your personality, and then go after it 100%. You mentioned earlier a book that you, you had written. Could you tell us about that and where our listeners can find it? 
Yeah, it's a, a little booklet with 50 reasons to use a trust, uh, all explained out. And if you go to my website, which is Land Trusts Made Simple dot com. That's land trusts with an S T R U S T S land trusts made simple dot com. In the upper right hand corner, uh, there's a phone number that you can text to and you'll get an immediate uh, response with the uh, booklet with 50 reasons to use a trust. Also on that website, I've got a whole lot of uh, information about trust that I've written that you can read for free as well. Um, and then if you decide to, to become a student of mine, um, I will give you a free membership for three months in my land trust university. And I'm kind of a little bit ahead of the curve here with everybody, uh, you know, trying to go online to educate. Uh, I, I started the land trust university in 2005 and it's an actual online learning university. Uh, you can uh, watch modules of me with video teaching certain modules of my course. Um, uh, you can listen to me in your car, on your cell phone, whatever, uh, and, and learn this material efficiently. You can take a little test. I quiz you a little bit after each module. Uh, you can see what the other students' uh, scores are and how you measure up. And then uh, I also do, uh, I'm the only guy on the planet writing a land trust newsletter for real estate investors. Uh, and I've done, there are, 10 years worth of my uh, newsletters in the Land Trust University. And I also do a monthly coaching call for my students. Once a month, we get together for an hour on a Saturday morning and we talk about trusts and LLCs and corporations and uh, uh, selling on a contract and lease options and all real estate related topics. Those uh, calls are recorded and, and in the Land Trust University, there's 10 years worth of calls uh, archived by subject matter. So you can go in there and say, oh, I'm interested in, in uh, lease options or whatever the subject is and, and listen to those calls. So it's, it, it is, um, it's a very unique website. There's nothing else like it on the planet. Uh, nobody else is teaching land trust information like this and, and certainly uh, providing a, a university type setting. So I encourage everybody to go and, and, and check it out and get all that free information. My phone number's on there too, so if you have any questions, uh, pick up the phone and call me. You know what, Dion? I answer my phone. Isn't that a unique way to service people in America today? It I really actually is. Answer my <laughs> phone. I mean, I don't know about you, but everybody I call never answers their phone, or they haven't set up their voicemail, or their mailbox is full, which leads you to total frustration. Uh, the only time I don't answer my phone, because I answer it seven days a week. The only time I don't answer it is if I'm on the line with somebody else and then I get right back to somebody who's called me. So uh, I, I'm kind of old fashioned when it comes to service. If you buy something from me, I think I owe you uh, at least good service on that product and, and, and just pick up the phone and call me. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Land Trust, Randy Hughes, for joining us today. I really appreciate it and uh, enjoyed our discussion, picked up a lot of golden nuggets, and I really hope that our listeners, you know, they'll, they'll uh, pick up some golden nuggets as well and, and reach out. Well, thank you for having me. I, I do apologize. I haven't had a, a haircut in almost three months now <laughs> because <laughs> my barber's close. I'm getting a little bushy here, but... Uh, as I understand, uh, here in Illinois, we're going to be able to start getting haircuts in about a week and a half. So I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> nice, nice. All right.